In this lecture, we talk about one of the most important and influential moments in American comics history, the establishment of the Comics Code Authority. Now, this moment is also closely connected to the demise of EC Comics, so we're going to talk about the rise and fall of EC Comics alongside the establishment of the Comics Code. And we're going to start with the boogeyman of comics, Frederick Wortham. Frederick Wortham was born in 1895 and died in 1981. He was a German-born psychiatrist specializing in child development. He has a really complicated legacy. We're going to talk about him in terms of comics, in which he's, well, kind of a villain, but he worked to establish mental health clinics in underserved neighborhoods in New York City. His work on the effects of racial segregation were very important in Brown versus the Board of Education, which overturned segregation in schools. And he later praised fandom, though not violent comics, as a beneficial creative outlet. But in question today is his most famous text, Seduction of the Innocent. Seduction of the Innocent was published in 1954 and centers on several theses. First, that violent images would make children violent. This is something that still gets argued about today when it comes to violent films or violent video games. However, he associated it with crime comics, horror comics, and even superhero comics. He also argued that the superhero's violence and might makes right philosophy was fascistic and deeply un-American. Finally, he argued that many popular comics, including superhero comics, featured subtle and not so subtle sexual imagery that would lead to sexual deviancy on the part of the children reading them. I don't agree with some of the stuff he's going to say, but I'm going to replay his arguments. For example, he argued that Wonder Woman was clearly a lesbian and had homosexual undertones. He also argued that the bondage imagery was problematic and would lead children to sexual deviancy. Now, if you remember from our Wonder Woman session, these things were in there kind of on purpose, and Marston knew what he was doing, but at the same time, Wonder Woman also became a figure of feminine empowerment, so it's pretty complicated. Funny story, after Wortham accused Wonder Woman of leading children to homosexuality, Marston decided to give her a catchphrase. Whenever she got frustrated, instead of saying, Great Caesar's ghost, like Superman did, she would say, Suffering Sappho. If you think the old Saturday Night Live jokes about Batman and Robin are new and modern, Wortham thought that Batman comics were psychologically homosexual and were training young children to be homosexual. He even so far as to call it blindingly obvious. DC Comics would end up giving Batman and Robin girlfriends shortly after the selection of the innocent to try and repair some of the damage caused by Wortham's claims. Now, Wortham wasn't the only one causing a ruckus. As always happens when a form or media is popular with kids, People get suspicious of it, and there had been a swell of fear about comic books for a long time, but Wortham's book managed to crystallize it. There was also a lot of fear about juvenile delinquency. In 1953, the U.S. Senate had developed a subcommittee on juvenile delinquency, child and teenage crime. And in April of 1954, in part inspired by Seduction of the Innocent and Wortham's work, they held a special hearing on juvenile delinquency and comic books. These hearings were open to the public and were televised. They called pro and anti comic book witnesses, although the star witnesses for each side were Frederick Wortham, against comic books, and Bill Gaines, speaking for comic books. Bill Gaines was the figurehead, the main publisher of EC Comics, the most famous producer of crime and horror comics, among other genres. So let's take a step back now and talk about Bill Gaines and EC Comics. So EC Comics was actually founded by Max Gaines, Bill Gaines' father. Max Gaines might have remember Max Gaines might tickle your brain. He was the guy who created famous funnies. Now, he had a previous publishing company called All American Comics, which he sold to DC in 1944. After selling DC, he founded EC which he called educational comics. He felt strongly that comics had a role in educating and edifying children who read them. And so his emphasis was on science, history, and especially Bible stories. The headline title for EC educational comics was picture stories from the Bible. However, Max 
died in a boat accident in 1947 and left the company to his son, William, better known as Bill, Gaines. Now, Bill began to focus on a new trend in EC, introducing genre books into the line, particularly fantasy and science fiction, and shifting away from education to entertainment, even going so far as to change the name from EC Education Comics to EC Entertainment Comics, or Entertaining Comics. By 1949, Bill Gaines had hired Al Feldstein and Harvey Kurtzman, who were originally artists, to work as editors and story developers, guiding a stable of highly talented freelance artists, including many of the artists you'll be reading. The titles of the new trend included Tales from the Crypt, The Vault of Horror, The Haunt of Fear, Weird Science, Weird Fantasy, Crime Suspense Stories, Shock Suspense Stories, Frontline Combat, Two-Fisted Tales, and Mad, which would later go on to become Mad Magazine. EC was different than some of the other comics publishers at the time. When many other publishers wouldn't even acknowledge its creators, barely giving a byline to its artists and authors, EC celebrated its creators. It also deliberately courted adult readership. It knew that many of its readers were adults and purposely wrote towards more mature audiences. Even though EC published many genres, across those genres and titles, there tended to be shared themes and traits. For example, most EC stories have poetic justice, often in the form of a twist ending. EC was very political, especially in science fiction and suspense comics, and political in a liberal way. It might seem tame to us now, but remember when you're reading these comics that these were written in the 1950s, when Jim Crow laws were still in effect across large swaths of the country. EC was also known for its black humor, especially in its crime and horror comics. The sort of humor like when you're watching the movie Scream. It's still a little scary, but you're laughing even as you're getting splashed with blood. The most popular titles were the crime and horror titles, which brings us right back to that subcommittee. It was also known for its pretty shocking images. For example, these are some of the covers of Vault of Horror, Tales from the Crypt, Crime and Shock Suspense Stories. And it's these kinds of covers that really brought EC Comics under fire when it came to the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency. One of the most famous exchanges in that hearing happens between Bill Gaines and several senators. A senator asks, then you think a child cannot in any way, shape, or manner be hurt by anything that that child reads or sees. Do not believe so, says Bill Gaines. There would be no limit, actually, to what you'd put in the magazines. Only within the bounds of good taste, Gaines replies. Here is your May issue, says the senator. This seems to be a man with a bloody axe holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. You think that's in good taste? Yes, sir, I do. The cover of a horror comic. Cover in bad taste, for example, might be defined as holding her head a little higher so that blood could be seen dripping from it, or moving the body a little further over so that the neck of the body could be seen to be bloody. You've got blood coming out of her mouth. A little. Needless to say, it didn't go well for Bill. Interestingly, Wortham also mentioned The Whipping, one of the EC stories you'll be reading for this week, and he argued that it was racist because it used racial slurs, missing the point that the people using the racial slurs were racists. But ultimately it didn't matter. The demise of EC was set in stone. After the hearings, owners and editors of different comics publishing houses, of different comics publishers, got together to form the Comics Magazine Association of America. Anticipating some sort of blowback, they decided that they would form their own sort of version of self-censorship and established the Comics Code Authority as a way to combat negative attitudes towards comics. Interestingly, 
Bill Gaines was actually on the Comics Magazine Association of America. He thought this might help. Ultimately, though, other people in the association would use the code against him. The code was not legally binding, but distributors and stores would refuse to sell books without the seal, which I've circled up there on the top. So you didn't have to follow it, but if you didn't follow it, your book wasn't going to get sold in the store. Interestingly, the code was largely followed until around 2000. It wasn't until 2001 when Marvel abandoned the Comics Code Authority. And it would actually stay in circulation in DC and Archie Comics until January 2011. So what's in the code? Well, the code is pretty detailed, and there's lots of places on the internet you can find the complete code. And here are some of the ones that I think are interesting. For example, the code says that you can never have sympathy for a criminal, or promote distrust of the forces of law or justice, or inspire folks to desire to imitate criminals. Good always had to triumph over evil. Criminals always had to be punished. Eventually, the code would be updated. But in the earliest versions of the code, you couldn't have zombies, vampires, ghouls, or werewolves. And you were supposed to avoid referencing or showing physical deformities or afflictions. They encouraged the use of good grammar and said slang was allowed, but maybe you shouldn't. Obviously, nudity was prohibited, but they asked characters to be dressed reasonable to accepted society. Well, reasonable to accepted society is pretty subjective, depending on who's doing the deciding that day. Respect for parents and the moral code and honorable behavior should be fostered. Live romance stories shall emphasize the value of home and the sanctity of marriage. Well, we saw how that went for romance comics. In all, it was really strict, and the only sorts of comics that could survive were really straightforward superhero comics. However, the establishment of the code was celebrated by a lot of parents and pundits as comic books finally cleaning up their act. And interestingly, the code was also retroactive, so republications of pre-code stories had to now submit to the current code standards. So these next two examples are from Captain America stories, which you've read. The original Red Skull from the pre-code was deemed too gruesome, and his hand being green had created the sense that he was undead or a zombie, and so it had to be changed. Likewise, on this page, again, our villain was too gruesome, and rather than redrawing him this time, they just erased him entirely. Interestingly, they didn't seem to have a problem with the racist caricature, just how scary it was. As we've already seen in superhero comics and romance comics, the effect of the Comics Code Authority was felt across the industry, and it's really hard to understate it. It would be about 10 years before the comics industry started to rebuild itself when a bunch of hippies out in San Francisco decided to buck the system. Next time, the rise of the underground comics. We'll see you then.